Welcome to Words to Live By, a podcast series hosted by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Each week, we will share some of the wit and wisdom of Ronald Reagan. In essence, Words to Live By. And the content is made up of radio addresses and speeches he delivered from the 1960s through the 1980s. In this week's podcast, we present President Reagan's remarks on East-West relations at the Brandenburg Gate in West Berlin, delivered on June 12, 1987. This speech is often commonly referred to as the Tear Down This Wall speech. Writing about that speech in his book, Speaking My Mind, Ronald Reagan said, The Brandenburg Gate and the Berlin Wall separate Berlin into East and West. In spite of the changes that are going on in communist countries, especially the Soviet Union, that wall is a reminder of the difference between freedom and totalitarianism. The people of East Berlin are walled in with barbed wire and booby-trapped explosives. Our advanced people had put up speakers aimed at East Berlin, hoping that my speech might be heard on the other side. I could see the East German police keeping people away so that they couldn't hear. They simply don't realize it's going to take more than that to keep out the stirrings of freedom. There's a couple of sentences in this speech about tearing down the wall and opening the gate that I like quite a bit, and it actually makes the speech. I'm told that the State Department and the National Security Council thought the lines were too provocative. Just because our relationship with the Soviet Union is improving doesn't mean we have to begin denying the truth. That is what got us into such a weak position with the Soviet Union in the first place. The line stayed and got quite a reaction from the crowd. How did the sentence get into the speech in the first place? Here's Peter Robinson to tell the story. It is true indeed. I was there for research. I was only there for about a day and a half. <clears throat> and I went around to various sites in Berlin, beginning with where the president would speak. And then that evening, I broke away from the American party, that is to say, the advanced men, the press people, and the security and so forth, and got into a cab and went out to a suburban home in West Berlin, where the Elzes, Dieter Elz and Ingeborg Elz, whom I had never met before, but we had friends in common in Washington, put on a dinner party for me of West Berliners, simply so I could get to know some West Berliners. And we chat a little bit, and then I said, I have to tell you that the ranking American diplomat in Berlin earlier today told me, President Reagan's speechwriter, don't, don't make a big deal out of the wall. They've gotten used to it by now. And I, and I had been flown over the wall in a US Army helicopter. So I said, I, is that tr it's, it looks to me as though it would be the kind of thing it would be hard to get used to. Is it true? Have you gotten used to it? And there was a silence. And then one man raised his arm and pointed. And he said, my sister lives just a few kilometers in that direction, but I haven't seen her in more than 20 years. You think we can get used to that? So they had stopped talking about it, but they hadn't gotten used to it. We went around the room. Another fellow said, I walk to work by the same route each day. I pass under a guard tower. And there's a young man on that tower with a rifle over his shoulder who looks down at me with binoculars. We share the same history, we speak the same language, but one of us is a zookeeper and the other is an animal. And I've never been able to decide which was which. And then our hostess, a lovely woman called, Inge called Ingeborg Elz, who just died a couple of years ago. And, and she was a lovely woman, she was a gracious hostess, but she became angry and she said, if this man Gorbachev means this talk, this perestroika, this glasnost, he can prove it by coming here and getting rid of that wall. And that was, now by this point I'd been in the White House for five years. I knew Ronald Reagan. I don't mean to say that I played cards with Ronald Reagan or that I was a guest at the ranch, nothing of that kind. The relationship was entirely professional, but we speechwriters, it was our job to know the mind of the president, to watch which material he liked, to understand how he thought. And I just knew the moment she said that, that if Ronald Reagan had been there, he would have responded to that. The simplicity, but the power of that remark. And so I put it into my notebook and went back to the White House. And that did become the basis for 
tear down this wall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chancellor Cole, Governing Mayor Deepkin, ladies and gentlemen, 24 years ago, President John F. Kennedy visited Berlin. And speaking to the people of this city and the world at the City Hall, well, since then, two other presidents have come, each in his turn to Berlin. And today, I myself make my second visit to your city. We come to Berlin, we American presidents, because it's our duty to speak in this place of freedom. But I must confess, we're drawn here by other things as well, by the feeling of history in this city, more than 500 years older than our own nation, by the beauty of the Grunwald and the Tiergarten, most of all, by your courage and determination. Perhaps the composer Paul Linke understood something about American presidents. You see, like so many presidents before me, I come here today because wherever I go, whatever I do, ich hab noch keinen Koffer in Berlin. Our gathering today is being broadcast throughout Western Europe and North America. I understand that it is being seen and heard as well in the East. To those listening throughout Eastern Europe, I extend my warmest greetings and the goodwill of the American people. To those listening in East Berlin, a special word. Although I cannot be with you, I address my remarks to you just as surely as to those standing here before me. For I join you as I join your fellow countrymen in the West in this firm, this unalterable belief, es gibt nur ein Berlin. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic south, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wire, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Farther south, there may be no visible, no obvious wall, but there remain armed guards and checkpoints all the same. Still a restriction on the right to travel. Still an instrument to impose upon ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state. Yet it is here in Berlin where the wall emerges most clearly. Here, cutting across your city, where the news photo and the television screen have imprinted this brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner forced to look upon a scar. President von Weizsäcker has said the German question is open as long as the Brandenburg Gate is closed. But today, today I say as long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open but the question of freedom for all mankind. <laughs> Yet, I do not come here to lament, for I find in Berlin a message of hope, 
even in the shadow of this wall, a message of triumph. In this season of spring in 1945, the people of Berlin emerged from their air raid shelters to find devastation. Thousands of miles away, the people of the United States reached out to help. And in 1947, Secretary of State, as you've been told, George Marshall, announced the creation of what would become known as the Marshall Plan. Speaking precisely 40 years ago this month, he said, our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. In the Reichstag a few moments ago, I saw a display commemorating this 40th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. I was struck by a sign, the sign on a burnt out gutted structure that was being rebuilt. I understand that Berliners of my own generation can remember seeing signs like it dotted throughout the western sectors of the city. The sign read simply, the Marshall Plan is helping here to strengthen the free world. A strong free world in the West that dream became real. Japan rose from ruin to become an economic giant. Italy, France, Belgium, virtually every nation in Western Europe saw political and economic rebirth. The European community was founded. In West Germany and here in Berlin, there took place an economic miracle. The Wirtschaftswandir. Adenauer, Erhardt, Reuter, and other leaders understood the practical importance of liberty, that just as truth can flourish only when the journalist is given freedom of speech, so prosperity can come about only when the farmer and businessmen enjoy economic freedom. The German leaders, the German leaders reduced tariffs, expanded free trade, lowered taxes. From 1950 to 1960 alone, the standard of living in West Germany and Berlin doubled. Where four decades ago there was rubble, today in West Berlin there is the greatest industrial output of any city in Germany. Busy office blocks, fine homes and apartments, proud avenues and the spreading lawns of Parkland. Where a city's culture seemed to have been destroyed, Today, there are two great universities, orchestras and an opera, countless theaters and museums. Where there was want, today there's abundance, food, clothing, automobiles, the wonderful goods of the Kudam. <laughs> from devastation, from utter ruin, you Berliners have in freedom rebuilt a city that once again ranks as one of the greatest on earth. And the Soviets may have had other plans, but my friends, there were a few things the Soviets didn't count on. Berliner Herz, Berliner Humor, Ja und Berliner Schnauzer. In the 1950s, in the 1950s, Khrushchev predicted, we will bury you. But in the West today, we see a free world that has achieved a level of prosperity and well-being unprecedented in all human history. In the communist world, we see failure, technological backwardness, declining standards of health, and now, now the Soviets themselves may, in a limited way, be coming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Some political prisoners have been released. Certain foreign news broadcasts are no longer being jammed. Some economic enterprises have been permitted to operate with greater freedom from state control. 
Are these the beginnings of profound changes in the Soviet state, or are they token gestures intended to raise false hopes in the West or to strengthen the Soviet system without changing it? We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, Come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. More from President Reagan's address after this message. The Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation is the nonprofit organization created by President Reagan himself and specifically charged by him with continuing his legacy and sharing his principles, individual liberty, economic opportunity, global democracy, and national pride. We must remain vigilant and work together to share these conservative principles with younger generations. Your role is critical to move our mission forward. Thank you for your continued support. Please visit reaganfoundation.org give. That's reaganfoundation.org slash give. Now back to President Reagan. I understand the fear of war and the pain of division that afflict this continent. And I pledge to you my country's efforts to help overcome these burdens. To be sure, we in the West must pre-resist Soviet expansion. So we must maintain defenses of unassailable strength. Yet we seek peace, so we must strive to reduce arms on both sides. Beginning 10 years ago, the Soviets challenged the Western Alliance with a grave new threat. Hundreds of new and more deadly SS-20 nuclear missiles capable of striking every capital in Europe the Western Alliance responded by committing itself to a counter-deployment. Unless the Soviets agreed to negotiate a better solution, namely the elimination of such weapons on both sides, for many months, the Soviets refused to bargain in earnestness. As the Alliance in turn prepared to go forward with its counter-deployment, there were difficult days, days of protests, like those during my 1982 visit to this city. And the Soviets later walked away from the table. But through it all, the Alliance held firm. And I invite those who protested then, I invite those who protest today to mark this fact. Because we remain strong, the Soviets came back to the table. Because we remain strong today, we have within reach the possibility not merely of limiting the growth of arms, but of eliminating for the first time an entire class of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. As I speak, NATO ministers are meeting in Iceland to review the progress of our proposals for eliminating these weapons. At the talks in Geneva, 
We have also proposed deep cuts in strategic offensive weapons. And the Western allies have likewise made far-reaching proposals to reduce the danger of conventional war and to place a total ban on chemical weapons. While we pursue these arms reductions, I pledge to you that we will maintain the capacity to deter Soviet aggression at any level at which it might occur. And in cooperation with many of our allies, the United States is pursuing the Strategic Defense Initiative, research to base deterrence not on the threat of offensive retaliation, but on defenses that truly defend, on systems, in short, that will not target populations, but shield them. By these means, we seek to increase the safety of Europe and all the world. But we must remember a crucial fact. East and West do not mistrust each other because we are armed. We are armed because we mistrust each other. And our differences are not about weapons, but about liberty. When President Kennedy spoke at the City Hall those 24 years ago, freedom was encircled. Berlin was under siege. And today, despite all the pressures upon this city, Berlin stands secure in its liberty, and freedom itself is transforming the globe. In the Philippines, in South and Central America, democracy has been given a rebirth. Throughout the Pacific, free markets are working miracle after miracle of economic growth. In the industrialized nations, a technological revolution is taking place, a revolution marked by rapid, dramatic advances in computers and telecommunications. In Europe, only one nation and those it controls refuse to join the community of freedom. Yet in this age of redoubled economic growth, of information and innovation, the Soviet Union faces a choice. It must make fundamental changes, or it will become obsolete. Today thus represents a moment of hope. We in the West stand ready to cooperate with the East to promote true openness to break down barriers that separate people, to create a safer, freer world. And surely there is no better place than Berlin, the meeting place of East and West, to make a start. Free people of Berlin today as in the past, the United States stands for the strict observance and full implementation of all parts of the Four Power Agreement of 1971. Let us use this occasion, the 750th anniversary of this city, to usher in a new era, to seek a still fuller, richer life for the Berlin of the future. Together, let us maintain and develop the ties between the Federal Republic and the Western sectors of Berlin, which is permitted by the 1971 agreement. And I invite Mr. Gorbachev, let us work to bring the eastern and western parts of the city closer together so that all the inhabitants of all Berlin can enjoy the benefits that come with life in one of the great cities of the world. To open Berlin still further to all Europe, East and West, let us expand the vital air access to this city, finding ways of making commercial air service to Berlin more convenient, more comfortable, and more economical. We look to the day when West Berlin can become one of the chief aviation hubs in all Central Europe. With, with our French, 
with our French and British partners, the United States is prepared to help bring international meetings to Berlin. It would be only fitting for Berlin to serve as the site of United Nations meetings or world conferences on human rights and arms control or other issues that call for international cooperation. There is no better way to establish hope for the future than to enlighten young minds. And we would be honored to sponsor summer youth exchanges, cultural events, and other programs for young Berliners from the East. Our French and British friends, I'm certain, will do the same. And it's my hope that an authority can be found in East Berlin to sponsor visits from young people of the Western sectors. One final proposal, one close to my heart. Sport represents a source of enjoyment and ennoblement. And you may have noted that the Republic of Korea, South Korea, has offered to permit certain events of the 1988 Olympics to take place in the North. International sports competitions of all kinds could take place in both parts of this city. And what better way to demonstrate to the world the openness of this city than to offer in some future year to hold the Olympic Games here in Berlin, East and West. In these four decades, as I have said, you Berliners have built a great city. You've done so in spite of threats, the Soviet attempts to impose the East Mark, the blockade. Today, the city thrives in spite of the challenges implicit in the very presence of this wall. What keeps you here? Certainly, there's a great deal to be said for your fortitude, for your defiant courage, but I believe there's something deeper something that involves Berlin's whole look and feel and way of life. Not mere sentiment. No one could live long in Berlin without being completely disabused of illusions. Something instead that has seen the difficulties of life in Berlin but chose to accept them, that continues to build this good and proud city in contrast to a surrounding totalitarian presence that refuses to release human energies or aspirations. Something that speaks with a powerful voice of affirmation, that says yes to this city, yes to the future, yes to freedom. In a word, I would submit that what keeps you in Berlin is love. Love both profound and abiding. Perhaps this gets to the root of the matter, to the most fundamental distinction of all between East and West. The totalitarian world produces backwardness because it does such violence to the spirit, thwarting the human impulse to create, to enjoy, to worship. The totalitarian world finds even symbols of love and of worship an affront. Years ago, before the East Germans began rebuilding their churches, they erected a secular structure, the television tower at Alexanderplatz. Virtually ever since, the authorities have been working to correct what they view as the tower's one major flaw, treating the glass sphere at the top with paints and chemicals of every kind. Yet even today, when the sun strikes that sphere, that sphere that towers over all Berlin, the light makes the sign of the cross. There in Berlin, like the city itself, symbols of love, symbols of worship, cannot be suppressed. 
As I looked out a moment ago from the Reichstag, that embodiment of German unity, I noticed words crudely spray painted upon the wall, perhaps by a young Berliner. Quote, this wall will fall, beliefs become reality. Yes, across Europe this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith, it cannot withstand truth. The wall cannot withstand freedom. And I would like, before I close, to say one word. I have read and I have been questioned since I've been here about certain demonstrations against my coming. And I would like to say just one thing, and to those who demonstrate so. I wonder if they have ever asked themselves that if they should have the kind of government they apparently seek, no one would ever be able to do what they're doing again. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. On November 9th, 1989, approximately two and a half years after President Reagan's most historic speech, the Berlin Wall fell. On September 12th, 1990, Ronald Reagan returned to the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, Germany, and saw firsthand the remaining portions of the Berlin Wall. What once stood as a symbol of Soviet domination now lay crumbled as a testimony to the strength of the people and their will and determination to overcome oppression and tyranny. When Reagan challenged General Secretary Gorbachev in 1987 to tear down this wall, he was confident that freedom would eventually prevail, but no one, including him, would ever have imagined how quickly this would take place. Nothing in Reagan's post-presidential years could compare to the satisfaction and pride he felt in seeing the Berlin Wall become a relic of the past. The people of the East were once again free, and Germany was united under one flag. In Reagan's lifetime, great progress had taken place, and the world had Ronald Reagan to thank for much of that change. On April 12, 1990, President Reagan stood next to a piece of the Berlin Wall. It had just been delivered for display at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. It weighed 6,338 pounds and stood nine and a half feet tall, just one piece with its colorful graffiti featuring a large butterfly on its west side and the stark gray concrete showing on its east side. President Reagan remarked, let our children and grandchildren come here and see this wall and reflect on what it meant to history. Let them understand that only vigilance and strength will deter tyranny. Thank you for listening. For more information on the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, including information on how to become a member, information on upcoming exhibits at the Reagan Library, or more information on the legacy of President Reagan, please visit reaganfoundation.org. And don't forget to like and follow the Reagan Foundation on all social media platforms. Until next week, thanks for listening. God bless you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Words to Live By podcast in your iTunes or Google Play stores and on other podcast platforms as they become available. New episodes of Words to Live By come out every Tuesday like what you hear? Check out our A Reagan Forum podcast featuring great speeches delivered at the Reagan Library. New episodes drop every Thursday. 
And don't forget to follow at Ronald Reagan on Facebook, at Ronald Reagan 40 on Twitter, and Reagan Foundation on YouTube. Also, search for us on SoundCloud and Stitcher.